I've not decided on who I'm voting for for Senate. Decision 2024, the final U.S. Senate debate starts now. Welcome to Universal City here in Los Angeles. We have rain today. The president of the United States is here and the next senator of the great state of California is here as well. Good evening, everyone. I'm Colleen Williams. The leading candidates for U.S. Senate have one last chance to make their pitch to voters before the primary election on March 5th. Tonight, NBC4 and Telemundo 52, in partnership with LMU, are bringing the debate to California voters. I'm joined by my colleagues, NBC4, Chief Reporter Conan Nolan and Telemundo 52 News Anchor Alejandra Ortiz. Muy buenas noches para todos. Good evening, everyone. In the next hour, we will be asking questions of the leading candidates that will showcase their differences. We are broadcasting and streaming both in English y en español. Aprovechen esta gran oportunidad para ser testigos de lo que cada uno de los candidatos se compromete a lograr si llega al Senado Federal y así en sus casas pueden tomar la mejor decisión 2024. With two weeks left, uh, nearly 30% of California voters say they're undecided in this race. Only two of the candidates will continue to the November general election. Tonight we speak with four top polling candidates. Democratic Congresswoman Barbara Lee, representing Oakland and Alameda County, former chair of the uh, Congressional Black Caucus. Democratic Congressman Adam Schiff of Burbank. Uh, he's a former chair of the House Intelligence Committee. Democratic Congresswoman Katie Porter of Irvine in Orange County. Uh, she is a former deputy chair of the House Progressive Caucus. And Republican Steve Garvey, a former great with the Los Angeles Dodgers and San Diego Padres. Many think he should be in the Hall of Fame. The question is, should he be in the halls of Congress? Thank you to all for coming. Our goal tonight is to explore the positions of all of these candidates. Our questions will focus on the job and the responsibility of a U.S. senator. The uh, candidates will have 60 seconds to respond to questions, 30 seconds for rebuttals at the discretion of the moderators, and 15 seconds for follow-ups. Conan. So uh, let's start with uh, inflation. Uh, it, it was supposed to tick down last month, but it went up. We noticed in the last debate, you spent, uh, at least the Democrats here, spent a lot of time talking about uh, the minimum wage. You wanted to double the federal minimum wage. You wanted to increase the minimum wage uh, here in California. There was Congresswoman Lee talked about a $50 an hour minimum wage. Uh, the minimum wage is going up in California in April for fast food workers of major chains to $20 an hour. Already, McDonald's, Jack in the Box, Chipotle say they're going to raise the cost on the menu to pay for all that. I believe uh, Pizza Hut said they're uh, laying off 1,200 uh, drivers. I want you to address to voters who think, well, listen, uh, this just makes the cost of living worse. Uh, speak to that and, and, and to the, the, the problem of inflation and how so many people watching tonight believe their money is worth less tomorrow than it is today because of the inflation rate. Can a senator do anything about it? Congressman Schiff, we'll have you start. You have there's, a minute. There's a lot that a California senator can do about this. Uh, and you're right. People are working harder than ever. The problem today uh, is not that people aren't working. The problem is they are working and they just can't make enough to get by. And the answer is not paying people less to try to keep inflation down. Uh, the answer is bringing down the cost of goods, bringing down the cost of housing, bringing down the cost of child care. We want to strengthen our economy. We need a way to make sure that uh, people can have good access to quality child care uh, and, in particular, women can participate in the workforce. That will raise the economy. But more than that, we need to bring down energy costs. We can do this with a windfall profits tax on oil companies. We can bring down the cost of housing by building a lot more housing. Conan, uh, my family came to California when I was 11 in search for a better life. And we found it here. My wife, uh, Eve, and yes, we're Adam and Eve, her family also came here uh, in search of a better life, and she found it here. Um, I want that to be true for future generations of Californians, and the way we can make that possible is by bringing down the cost of goods, and Thank particularly you. housing. Thank you. Uh, Congresswoman Porter, inflation. Good evening, California. 
We need to make sure that Washington is focusing on our biggest challenge, which is the cost of living. Decade after decade, career politicians haven't focused on our challenges, including the cost of housing, the cost of child care, the cost of elder care, the cost of college. Yes, we need to make sure that workers get paid a wage that reflects what they contribute at their companies and at their jobs. But we also need Washington to get in the game. Decade after decade, they haven't been there. You can't raise a wage an hour or two and close the tremendous gap that people face in trying to afford childcare or college. My colleague, Representative Schiff, says, for example, that he wants to bring down the costs of child care, but he isn't on either of the two major Democratic bills that would do that. He's not on a bill to provide rental assistance to people for housing, although all of these things are in his plans. That's the thank, gap between Congressman, you, Congressman Schiff and candidate Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Garvey. Well, these career politicians, uh, three years ago, they were on the watch that has created what it is today. When the president took office, he signed 90 different bills. And what he did was he, he turned off gas and oil. And when that happens, energy goes through the roof. It affects all elements of our life. But what really happened is the overspending in Washington, which caused inflation. And it goes from the table in the morning where mom's trying to figure out the week whether she can feed her children as she wants to, to the gas station where we've seen uh, gas go up two, three dollars. And by the way, uh, when I go to the gas station at 7.30 in the morning, hardworking Californians are, are going there. They're not buying 10 gallons. They're buying $10 worth of gas. And then it goes to schools and affordability. But this was all on their watch. Thank you, Mr. Garvey. Uh, Congressman Lee, you're sticking by the $50 an hour minimum wage. Let's be honest. First of all, um, we have to talk about what it takes for people to live in California. We have a huge affordability crisis. The cost of living is much too high. First, at the federal level, of course, we have to raise the minimum wage. We haven't raised it in a decade. $7.25 to $17 in 2025. Okay, great first step. But in California, for example, we have $16 an hour now. Uh, and believe you me, every single study that you have seen that has been written about the affordability crisis in California, people are working two and three jobs just to pay rent, just to afford childcare. We have to think about and talk about a living wage. What does it mean to have a living wage in California? Over $100,000 in many parts of California, people are just barely surviving. They're living on the edge. So we have to think about what it takes to make sure that people can afford to live in California. You, that means a living wage. Thank you, Congresswoman. Mr. Schiff, you were mentioned by uh, Congresswoman Porter. You have 15 seconds to respond to that. Uh, Conan, there's nothing easier than putting your name on a bill. Uh, where you see the real legislators is they write their own legislation. I've introduced numerous bills to bring down the cost of child care to make sure that we build child care into new federal facilities, that we raise the wages for child care workers. We have a real scarcity, not of people willing to do child care work, but of people willing to do it for poverty wages. So my legislation would raise uh, incomes for those incredibly uh, essential workers. I don't think any family should be spending more than 5 or 10 percent of their income on child care, so I would provide a tax credit as okay. well for child care. Uh, so uh, a follow-up to this, a tremendous amount of federal money has been spent over the past two administrations. Uh, recently, the head of the Congressional Budget Office on Capitol Hill said that the deficit is getting to, uh, will be, what, $2.6 trillion in 10 years. Um, he called it an existential threat to the economy because the service on the debt will be so great, it'll crowd out federal spending, including a lot of the programs you'll be talking about tonight. I'm just curious, do you consider the deficit a problem, or will it work its way out, work itself out? Or... Um, if, if the federal budget needs to be cut, where would you cut? You don't have much time on this. 30 seconds. Congresswoman Porter, I'll have you start. 
I think that we need to be fierce advocates for our tax dollars. We, we are all sending our money to Washington and we should expect a return on that money. So I am proud to, to be one a person who will do the oversight, who will push and who will ask, are we getting a return? Is this bill going to invest in America's future or is it just pork barrel spending to satisfy career politicians, corporate donors? So I'm going to champion investing in things like education right. and infrastructure yep. where it turns money to the United right. States. Is the deficit's not an issue for you? The deficit is an issue, okay. and where we should cut it is wasteful military spending with the Pentagon, which has never passed okay. an audit. Thank you. Congressman uh, Schiff, could you um, take that issue, the deficit? Yeah, the deficit is a real problem, uh, and I think a big part of the reason why it's a problem is that the wealthy and corporations are not paying their fair share. There are fewer than 800 families that combined own the wealth of more than half of the families in America. That's just wrong. We have to repeal the Trump tax cuts. Uh, I think we could restore balance to our budget if people were paying their fair share, if some of those high-priced ballpayers were paying as much effectively as the, the fans in the stands, the working fans. And I don't know if Mr. Garvey is with me on that. Uh, I think he's not with me on that, <laughs> but I think that would help address some of the budget deficit we have. Okay, uh, Congresswoman Lee. Yeah, the budget deficit is a problem. And let me tell you, when these Trump era tax cuts expire, the billionaires uh, must be part of paying their fair share. So we need to go back to the tax code and make sure the billionaires do pay their fair share. But it was said earlier that the Pentagon uh, had uh, not been audited. Well, it's myself who led with a Republican to insist that the Pentagon be audited. And we learned that the Pentagon very recently has flunked its sixth audit. So it's about time that Democrats follow myself and will in the Senate to audit the Pentagon and to claw back that money. Thank you very and much. And waste, fraud, and abuse. Mr. Garvey, would, uh, is there anything in the federal budget you'd cut? Well, let me just go back. To, uh, of course the debt is serious. Over the last four years, we've seen the debt go sky high. Why? Because it's excessive spending by government. And my fellows up here, they understand that. It's been on their watch. 60 years of, of combined congressional uh, work has caused this spiraling debt to go higher and higher. So let's get back to cutting interest rates. The Fed, just the last week, even though the, Thank uh, you. the administration kept touting that, that uh, all of a sudden this inflation has gone Thank down, you. it hasn't. Thank you, Mr. Garvey. At least two of you have talked about military spending in the Pentagon, so let's talk about military readiness. U.S. Army has not met their recruitment goals in nearly a decade. Secretary of the Air Force has recently expressed serious concerns about Air Force preparedness, the readiness here. Given the state of the world right now, is the U.S. sending enough? Are they spending enough on defense? Are we prepared for any kind of major conflict? Congresswoman Porter, you have 60 seconds. There's no doubt that the world is facing new dangers and our country is facing new threats. I have led on issues, for example, of the threats that we're facing in the Indo-Pacific from China and other regional powers. This is a time to be investing in diplomacy. Yes, we have the strongest military in the world, and I particularly want to support the amazing people, like my brother, who step up and who serve, who are veterans and service members, and we need to recruit our best and brightest into the military. At the same time, we have to make sure that that's where our tax dollars are going, to actually make us safer, not just to help huge corporations get richer through the Pentagon budget. And we have seen a number of failures in this regard. And so I think it's really important that we separate out those issues. How do we keep our men and women safe? How do we keep our country safe? That means someone who's going to look forward, look at the future, and understand the threats that are coming from AI, from cyber, and from new kinds of technology. Mr. Garvey. National defense is our single most important issue. Without that, everything else is irrelevant. Peace through strength. We have to remember that we're the torchbearer for democracy around the world. We have to have policy that shows our enemies that we're serious, we will address every issue when approached. But we also have to make sure our military is, is, is capable, technology-wise, uh, militarily, uh, we have to have the best equipment. So we need to make sure that our military is fully funded at all times. 
Congresswoman Lee, you have 60 seconds. I am the daughter of a veteran, 25 years. He served in World War II and Korea, served in Japan. He was a proud patriot, and he told me over and over and over again to make sure that our readiness was intact, but also that we protect our troops. And let me tell you, the Pentagon budget is excessive. It's $890 billion. We need to cut at least $100 billion out of the military budget and put into readiness and put into our troops. I lead each and every year in my effort to get past the People Over Pentagon Act, and in the Senate, I will do that. Military contractors, they're scamming the taxpayers. We recently, we tried and I worked with Republicans to claw back money that weapons dealers uh, really uh, stole from the Pentagon in terms of tax dollars. And so, no, we need to reduce the military budget, put more into readiness into our troops, into our veterans, into our domestic needs, and we also need to put more into development and Ms. diplomacy Ms. instead Ms. of increasing the military budget. Thank you, Mr. Schiff. A colleague, my dad uh, is 96. He joined the service at the end of World War II. He actually went to join the Marine Corps, but uh, failed the physical. He had flat feet and bad eyesight. Uh, two weeks later, he went to join the Army, thinking maybe they had a different physical standard, maybe a different examining physician. Turns out, same standard, same physician. Uh, and the guy recognized my dad, and he said, you really want to get in that bad? And my dad said yes, and he was in the Army. Uh, he raised his two sons uh, to have great respect for those who wear the uniform. Um, we have a challenge recruiting because we don't pay our service members enough for the dangers that they have to face and the hardships their families have to face. Uh, and there are areas where we need to cut the Pentagon budget. I remember meeting with President Obama uh, to discuss our deficit and debt problem, and one of my colleagues used the occasion to argue for more F-22s, something the Pentagon said they didn't need, we couldn't afford. And the President said, you know, if we're going to handle the deficit, I need to make national security decisions based on national security, and that's what we need to do. Ms. Mr. Schiff, thank you. Um, Follow-up question here, and this will be 30 seconds. Ms. Lee, this goes to you first. Um, I, I keep hearing the best equipment, um, training, readiness here. There have been a number of military crashes recently. Defense Department Go Government Accountability Office reports equipment is aging. All branches, all branches of the military need to rebuild, restore, and modernize. We have military bases here in the state of California that stretch from Southern California, San Diego, all the way north. We hear all the time, thank you for your service. But in reality, is Washington doing enough to service the service members, to protect them, to keep them safe? Ms. Lee, I start with you. 30 seconds, please. It's a matter of priorities and how the Pentagon spends your tax dollars. The Pentagon needs to put more resources into readiness, into making sure that our troops are protected, rather than allowing these weapons dealers to steal taxpayer dollars. And that is exactly what's happening. That is why I work with my Republican colleagues to expose what was taking place at the Pentagon just a couple of months ago. That's why I required now the Pentagon to be audited. It's flunked, as I said, six audits. We need to put those resources into our troops, into our veterans, and make sure that they're safe yes, and have the equipment that they need. Thank you. Mr. Schiff. Um, I've had the opportunity, and this is really, I think, the most rewarding part of uh, serving in Congress, to visit our troops all over the world. I've been in these Ospreys that have tragically been crashing and killing our service members. There's no higher priority for me than making sure that our service members are safe. And part of what's so valuable about doing that oversight in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in, and, and elsewhere is getting the ground truth from people about whether they're well equipped, whether they feel they have the resources they need, because you don't often hear that from the generals in the in the Klieg lights in the hearing rooms. Uh, it's important to me to get the ground truth, and I do. Ms. Porter. I think that we need to be stimulating more defense, uh, more competition among our defense contractors. For too many decades, Washington gave sweetheart deals to certain defense contractors through earmarks. And there is a candidate on this stage who has done that again and again, getting earmarks for his private corporate donors who are big defense contractors. So I think we need to be prioritizing making sure the people doing the work have the equipment they need. So I'm proud to lead bills to address food insecurity among veterans and to make it easier to get better military housing. Mr. Garvey. And I'll wrap all of this up by saying freedom has no cost to it. It's whatever it takes. And I think freedom in this country starts on the ground, 
in the air, and in the sea. And I agree, whatever it takes to do this, and we have to be diligent, uh, because we are the torchbearer for the world, we do continue to, to serve our, our allies, but let's make sure America's ready. Mr. Schiff, I will give you 15 seconds for rebuttal for that comment from Ms. Porter. Look, uh, we have a strong disagreement over whether senators should bring back resources for their state. I believe that they should. Representative Porter doesn't believe they should. She prefers a political talking point. But look, I want to bring back billions, just as Feinstein did, to help people find shelter, to help people uh, get food when they're hungry. And any senator who won't do that is going to be a gift to the senators from every Thank other you. state of the union who will fight for resources for their state. Thank you for your response. I would like to respond. Go ahead. 15 seconds. Please. The truth is California only gets two senators. That'll be 2% of the earmarks. Yet we're 12% of the United States population. Earmarks are about inviting corruption, conflicts of interest, and rewarding people's donors. Don't believe you don't, Representative Schiff has that track record. Look for yourself. Congresswoman Porter, thank you. As a journalist who has covered the Latino community for many years now, there's a lot of people, a lot of people I've talked to on the street who believe, they really believe from the bottom of their hearts that they're being used by your party, the Democratic Party, every time there's an election. You have promised an immigration reform time after time, over and over again, but even when you had control of the House, the Senate, and the White House, you failed to pass an immigration reform. Why should voters, Latino voters, trust you now on this issue, I'll start with you, Congress Member Porter. Look, I'm someone who went to Washington to do things differently. I'm not satisfied with what Democrats or Republicans have been delivering. I'm of a generation who has only ever known the amazing contributions that immigrants make. The House of Representatives passed the Dream and Promise Act to help give status to our, to deliver not just a pathway to citizenship, but we need to give citizenship now to our dreamers to provide protections for TPS. It went to the Senate where it died. That's why I'm running to shake up the Senate. <coughs> the, I'm not going to offer you the status quo, because the status quo has been unacceptable and not enough for millions of Americans. I'm tired of hearing about comprehensive immigration reform. I want to do it. I'm tired of talking about pathways to citizenship. I want to give people those opportunities. The chaos, the struggles we're seeing in our immigration system benefit big corporations who take advantage of undocumented labor to pad their bottom line, and it should stop. Ms. Porter, thank you for your response. Ms. Lee. You've been in Congress for 26 years now. Do you bear any responsibility for this? Let me uh, first say that uh, our Latino community um, should not trust us. They should uh, grade us based on the work that we have done, our voting record, and exactly what we believe in and just in terms of immigrants. One, I was born in El Paso, Texas, in an immigrant community in a border town. Secondly, I understand the importance of comprehensive immigration reform because border security will not work without comprehensive immigration reform. Thirdly, it is a shame and disgrace that we cannot allow our DACA students, our dreamers, to become United States citizens. And in the, in the Senate, that would be the first thing I would do in terms of making sure that I fight with Senator Padilla to ensure the pathway to citizenship for our dreamers, as well as our farm workers. We haven't protected our farm workers the way we should. The Farm Worker Modernization Act should have been passed by the Senate by now. It hasn't been. And so it's very important that Latino voters understand that there are some who may not believe that immigrants deserve the dignity and the humane treatment, but our record Thank speaks you, for Lee. itself and up. should grade us on our record. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Your time's up. Thank you. Mr. Schiff, you've been in Congress for 24 years almost now this year. What is your take on this? Well, I think you're absolutely right that uh, when Democrats controlled the House and the Senate, as we did during the first uh, two years of the Biden administration, as we did for a period during the Obama administration, the Democratic Party didn't get this done. And that's on our party. Now, we're never going to get the help from the Republicans. Uh, Mr. Garvey's party believes that this is a political gift that will never stop giving. They're not going to help us with this. We're going to have to do it ourselves, which means we're going to have to get rid of the filibuster and pass a truly comprehensive immigration reform. I'm going to go to the Senate to work with Alex Padilla and fight to make sure that happens. It's unconscionable that we haven't done it. Uh, I, you know, I remember speaking to a farm worker 
who lives in Mexico, comes across the border every day, gets up at one in the morning, works in our fields for eight hours in the 100 degree heat, then goes back through the port of entry for a few hours with his family, one of the most hardworking people I've ever met. He is deserving of a pathway to citizenship because of my record of advocacy and leadership, the Churla Action Fund, one of the premier immigrant rights groups has endorsed me, the United Farm Workers have endorsed me. Thank they you, know Mr. I will be a champion in the Mr. Senate Mr. for Thank truly comprehensive reform. Thank you, your time's up. Mr. Garvey, the recent bipartisan immigration bill, a historic one, was killed by Republicans two weeks ago, apparently because Donald Trump wants to keep the issue alive so he can use it in his presidential campaign. How can Latinos trust Republicans on this issue as well? And you have 60 seconds. Well, first of all, it's an honor to be with the Latino community tonight. We've had 50 years of a, of a wonderful relationship. And that's why, as your next elected U.S. Senator from California, I pledge that you will be my priority. You are the hardworking Californians who get up every day, have come here the right way, the right way to California, because this was your dream. And you're experiencing that dream, but you're not experiencing that dream uh, through inflation, uh, through other challenges, but you deserve to be protected. And that's why that 544 page bill could have been done by one swipe of the pen by the president. And all they needed was one page to say, secure the border and let's stop illegal immigrants from coming to this country and infiltrating our communities and taking away from, from those people who are the heart and soul of California. And talking about that uh, bill, this is a follow-up question to all of you. That bipartisan border security bill was called the most conservative immigration bill in 40 years in our country. It would have raised the standards for asylum seekers. It would have provided more border security. It would have allowed border closures during surges of illegal crossings. The bill was supported by President Biden, but Senator from California Alex Padilla voted against it. How would you have voted, Ms. Lee? You have 15 seconds. I uh, would have voted no, quite frankly. For me, the bill was not meeting the standard that I insist on, and that is immigration reform should include comprehensive immigration reform. It should be humane. It should include you, provisions for it being orderly, and it should have due process. And this did not have any of that. Thank you, Congress Member Lee. Mr. Schiff. Uh, Alex Padilla had no seat at the table during these no negotiations, mm -hmm. nor did any other Hispanic caucus member, nor did any other board of Democrat. It's not surprising the package turned out to be so lopsided. Uh, I would support a package that had a comprehensive immigration reform. This was not that. Your time's up. Thank you. Ms. Porter? I would have definitely voted no on the immigration package. It was against our American values. It demonized um, immigrants by trying to ignore the fact that they come here seeking a better life. The reality is our country needs immigrants. If we're going to have a strong economy in the future, we should be focusing on the real problems like fentanyl, human trafficking, and gun trafficking. Mr. Garvey? If that bill comes around again, how would you vote? <laughs> Not the way it was laid out. There were too many things packed in there, too many things hidden. I would have voted against it. Thank uh, you, Mr. Let's turn to uh, a fundamental issue to being a U.S. senator, and that is war and peace. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to ask a couple of yes or no questions. You can pretend that they're four votes, A or nay, but then I'll have you, give you an opportunity to explain. This week is the, um, is the second anniversary of the Russian invasion into Ukraine. Uh, can we stipulate that the three House Democrats would have voted for the Senate bill authorizing $60 billion in aid to Ukraine, that you would have voted for that? Yes. Mr. Garvey, would you have voted for that? Yes. Yes. Sir? Okay. Excuse so, me. Uh, all righty. It would depend on what else is in that bill, and I'm not certain I would have voted for it. Right. But did you read the Senate bill? Did you know what was in it? Most of what was in it, but in the bill, there were provisions oh, okay. that I did not right. agree with. All right. So let's ask again a couple of yes or no questions. These are, these are four votes. If um, the, the president has said on a number of occasions that the United States would deploy U.S. troops to, uh, to aid Taiwan if there was an invasion by China, do you support that platform, uh, Congresswoman Lee? No? Yes, no? No, I would not support that. Right. Mr. Schiff? I support the president's position. Uh, uh, Congresswoman Porter? 
I would support safeguarding us from the threat of China. Okay. So U.S. troops in, in okay. Mr. Garvey? No troops on the ground. Okay. So um, if there was a resolution on the floor that said um, the United States stands, in, uh, stands with Israel in its determination, there will be no peace in Gaza until the Hamas government is removed uh, in the leadership position that it holds in the Gaza Strip. Uh, we support that declaration by the Israeli government. Yes or no, Congresswoman Lee? No, I support a ceasefire. Oh, That's the only it. way right. Congressman Israel, Israel, Israel will Schiff? be secure and yes. the Palestinians. I'm will. sorry. You vote yes for that, Mr. Schiff? Yes, I would. Okay. Ms. Porter? I would yes vote, or no? I would vote no because Okay, Israel... you can explain later, but you vote no. Mr. Garvey? No ceasefire. Okay. So, uh, uh, again, um, uh, along the same lines, we'll, we'll flip it. Uh, would you vote for a resolution that said Israel has to impose an immediate ceasefire right now, no conditions, unconditional ceasefire, end the war? Congresswoman Lee? Yes. Okay, Mr. Schiff? No. Ms. Porter? No. Mr. Garvey? No. Okay. I'll have you explain uh, those. Um, but in doing so, I'd like you also to ex express uh, your sentiment towards what the 45th president of the United States has said, and many people in the United States, America first, they want us disengaged from the world. Uh, Donald Trump has said on a number of occasions that uh, he, he questions whether we should be in the NATO alliance, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Uh, there's concerns about us pulling out. What is the role of the United States uh, in the world uh, in terms of American foreign policy? Uh, and you have 60 seconds. Congresswoman Lee, we'll start with you. Global peace and security uh, has got to be a priority for our foreign policy. And let me just explain what I mean. I uh, was the former chair when we were in the majority of the Appropriations Committee that funded all of our development and diplomacy, preventing wars. We funded it to the I believe it was about $60 billion. Defense was about $840 billion. We need to rebalance our foreign policy. We need to make sure that we put more into preventing wars, into development and diplomacy, and reduce the military budget. In many ways, that is the only pathway to peace. The United States needs to lead in seeking a peaceful world, and that is the only way this planet is going to survive. And yes, we have many challenges. The military option is going to always be there, but we must put more of our investments into preventing wars, into development and diplomacy, humanitarian needs, and helping young people, especially throughout the world, uh, understand that Thank they have a future. Much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman Schiff. America's role in the world. Well, first of all, um, Israel has a right to defend itself. Um, it was uh, horribly attacked uh, on October 7th. I, and I don't see how there can be a lasting peace as long as a terrorist organization is governing Gaza and threatening to attack them over and over and over again, nor do I see how there can be a permanent ceasefire while that is true. Nevertheless, uh, Israel must make every effort to avoid civilian casualties, and we must make every effort to get the parties to a two-state solution. Uh, turning to the former president in Ukraine, Ukrainians just lost Avdivka, a city that they had gained uh, in reclaiming part of their land. That was a terrible loss to Ukraine. It was a terrible loss, I think, to democracy. And it was occasioned in part because Republicans in Congress would not approve aid to Ukraine, which we should approve immediately. Uh, and I'm calling on the president, if Congress won't act, to use seize Russian assets uh, to help fund Ukraine and its war effort. We remain the indispensable nation in the world. We cannot abdicate that responsibility, neither Thank in the you. Middle East nor in Ukraine. Congresswoman Porter. The United States should be a beacon for freedom, for democracy, and for human rights. That's the touchstone that should guide our foreign policy, and we should be centered on those three values with every country in the world. Um, I think it is important to recognize that this conflict in Gaza, the result of the horrific attack by Hamas, um, is one in which the parties to the conflict must determine what will be a lasting ceasefire for them. We can't just pass resolutions and make it so. The United States needs to support peace. We need to recognize. Some on this stage will not. We need to recognize the incredible humanitarian disaster unfolding in Gaza, and we need to be firm and clear to Israel as our ally that we expect them to be a champion for peace and democracy. Um, I think it is important that we, that we live our values in this way and that we're investing in diplomacy. Donald Trump did terrible, 
terrible damage to our standing on the world stage, allowing Iran and Russia to grow in power, and we're all paying for the consequences. Thank you. Um, Mr. Garvey, there are plenty in the country who believe we are overextended. America first. We should focus on domestic issues and not be um, essentially the police officer for the world. Mm -hmm. What do you say? Well, my campaign is based on common sense and compassion and consensus building. I think I said earlier, we're the torchbearer for democracy around the world. Uh, the world is watching us and how we support our allies. Uh, we're supporting our ally in Ukraine. Uh, we're looking at Taiwan, obviously, if they need help. Uh, as I've said, I support Israel yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And I believe all these countries we support have the right to their sovereignty. But as everybody looks at us for strength or weakness, we have to maintain that strength so that when people look at us, we are a deterrent for China, for Russia, for Iran, anyone who feels that they can become a threat to democracy. Mr. Conan, I agree with Mr. Garvey. We should be the torchbearer not. of democracy. But how is that possible well, well, with Donald Trump? Well. How is that right. possible? I, I, I appreciate that. that. Mr. Thank Garvey you very much for the support. You, you took up the, the seconds that he wasn't using. Uh, you could respond to that, Mr. Garvey. Uh, the the this comment from Congressman Schiff. I didn't understand what he was talking about. Well, well, uh, well let, let me explain. Well, no, 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 no. How, how, I, how we appreciate we that, Congressman. Democracy we, with we, Donald we, Trump. We appreciate president. it. Defend. Uh, his argument is that you voted for Donald Trump twice. You've said you ha haven't decided on what's going to happen. But uh, de defend, in your words, uh, the foreign policy agenda that of the previous president. 30 seconds. I look into this camera and talk to the citizens of California. One-on-one, -on -one, as your senator, I will do everything to maintain your security. I don't, I'm not concerned with any one being. I'm concerned with 38 million Californians and 330 million Americans. Ms. Porter, you have 15 seconds. Look, the reality is Mr. Garvey has been unclear on where he stands with regard to Donald Trump. He's even said he might vote for Joe Biden. There is a Republican that is dangerous in this race, and that's Trump Republican Eric Early, who has said he will be 100 percent MAGA at all times. Okay, thank you very much, Congresswoman. I appreciate that. This debate is in partnership with LMU, and so our next question comes from Garrett Howard Jimenez. He's a sophomore at LMU studying marketing and management. Let's listen in. As a younger person worried about the irreversible impacts of climate change, I'm wondering what actions you will commit to to meaningfully address the issue. All right, Mr. Garvey, you have 30 seconds to respond to that. I think climate change is real. Um, I think it's both man-made and, and both natural. Uh, I believe that three years ago there was a rush to judgment by the administration. I believe that uh, gas and oil uh, lines were, were turned off, which caused uh, a tremendous strain on our economy. Uh, I think if it would have been more thought out, uh, this would have had less stress. But I think the most important thing for us to do is always be aware um, that in this country, uh, we do have problems in, the, in Mr. Garvey. What I'm saying, oh, just quickly to just, just wrap this up. Time's up. Okay, Time's up. thank you. Um, Ms. Porter, your response. I am proud to be the candidate in this race who has spent time working in Congress on climate issues. I serve on the House Natural Resources Committee, and I've had bills passed into law to hold big polluters to account. Look, I'm different than Representative Schiff. He's taken corporate PAC checks from BP, from Sempra, from SoCal Gas, and these are household names. They are polluters. So people can count on me to do Washington differently and deliver the climate change that we have been waiting for for so long. Congressman Schiff, you have 30 seconds to respond. Well, first of all, my record of the environment goes back to my days as a prosecutor. When here in Los Angeles, I formed the first federal environmental crimes unit to go after big oil companies and prosecute them. I prosecuted people for smuggling hazardous waste into Mexico. In the state Senate, I carried legislation to expand mass transit. And in Congress, I've carried legislation to expand uh, uh, cutting edge research into renewable and green energy jobs and also to crack down on the oil companies with a windfall profits tax on the oil companies.
But I would like some time to respond to Representative Porter. And you have 15 seconds yeah. to respond to that. I don't think Representative Porter has been fully clear about her own record of taking thousands of dollars from people in the oil industry, thousands from Wall Street bankers, thousands from uh, people in the pharma industry, as Open Secrets has revealed. The problem with uh, purity tests, as Representative Porter would like to establish, is invariably the people establishing them don't meet them. What Californians Mr. want is someone who can get things done, Mr. not that sets up Time's false up. purity tests. Ms. Porter, you have a... I would like 30 seconds to respond. That's, what, 15 he, that's seconds what he to used respond was 30 seconds. seconds. Rebuttal, please. No, he had 30 seconds to respond to climate change. You have 15 seconds to respond to the rebuttal. The truth is that the ad running against me by a dark, shady super PAC has been rated false. Don't take my word for it. Independent fact checkers at the Sacramento Bee have rated that ad false. Look, I made a choice when I ran for office to never take corporate PAC money. Representative Schiff made a different choice and has taken and nearly $2 million, including from Big up. Oil, Big Banks, Time's and Big up. Pharma. Time's up. Congresswoman Lee, would you like to weigh in on climate change? Well, listen, I don't think any of um, my opponents here tonight have ever lived in a neighborhood where a smelter was emitting toxic pollutants and chemicals throughout their childhood. I lived, as I said earlier, in El Paso, Texas, in a black and brown community where these toxic chemicals made everyone sick and had lasting health impacts. Climate justice is extremely important, and in the Senate, I would fight to make sure we pass the Green New Deal, which includes a just transition for our workers from a fossil fuel economy to a green economy, and pass all of our environmental justice laws so that we can make sure Thank our frontline communities Thank and you. our vulnerable communities are compensated Thank and are you. able to live free from toxic pollutants. Uh, so uh, I'm curious, nobody mentioned climate change, nobody mentioned nuclear. California has one remaining nuclear power plant, Diablo Canyon uh, at Avila Beach. Um, it represents 10% of the power grid. Uh, it, it runs rain or shine. It's not weather dependent. It does not contribute to global warming. Uh, it takes up a fraction of the space of the massive wind and solar farms that you've advocated. I'm just, you know, the governor has extended, got the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to extend its life another five years. pg e wants it another 15. The president is in support of nuclear. Can't meet our climate goals without it. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious, A, do you support the extension of Diablo Canyon, and does nuclear have a role in fighting uh, uh, climate change? Uh, Congresswoman Porter, uh, you have 30 seconds. I think Diablo Canyon needs to be safely decommissioned. I see this issue in my own backyard with nuclear waste from a, a, a energy plant. So did you oppose the extension? Yes, I would, as I just said. I would close Diablo Canyon. Um, I think the timetable that has been established is effective. I do believe we have to be investing in new technology for energy. I'm a proud member of the Nuclear Fusion Caucus, which is a form of energy that doesn't produce any of the hazardous waste and have the risk of dangerous accidents like the current um, plants in Diablo Canyon. Uh, Congressman Schiff, nuclear. Uh, I support the governor's plan to decommission the plant, but I also think that nuclear energy has a role to play in our energy portfolio. Uh, look, we're going to need to move to renewable energy. We're going to need to move to wind and solar. We're going to have to have new transmission to get energy from where it's developed to where it's utilized. Uh, but if we want to get ahead of the tipping point, and I really believe that we, we can get ahead of this tipping point, and we must uh, we need a Green New Deal. We need to move with a sense of urgency away from fossil fuels that are killing us and killing the planet and to green energy sources. But nuclear is part of it. I think nuclear is part of it. Congresswoman Lee? Well, I support the decommissioning of, of the Diablo Canyon a nuclear plant. Um, I don't support nuclear power. I know that we have to have a just transition to a green economy, and that means the jobs that could be uh, lost as a result of transitioning into a green new deal uh, would have to be uh, made certain that the workers had the job training, the retraining, and the workforce development, and the wages and benefits to be able to transfer out of a nuclear power plant. Plant. So I fully support decommissioning. Right, but, the, the, but it was supposed to be de decommissioned next year. It's been extended five years. Did okay. you ex support the extension? No, I don't support okay. the extension. Got it. Mr. Garvey? I believe in nuclear energy. I believe this plant should be, uh, become safe and uh, it should be viable. Uh, I think when we talk about clean energy, uh, we talk about nuclear, we talk about wind. Uh, but there's always a place for gas and oil. This country runs on gas and oil. When it's all said and done, the people will decide. 
they're the ones that will tell us what they can afford and what they need. Thank you. All right, let's talk a little bit about AI, artificial intelligence. It presents legal, economic, and ethical challenges from security risks, consumer scams, privacy concerns. In fact, it really was the center of two major uh, strikes this summer. We're talking about the WGA and SAG-AFTRA. 30-second question here. How can we have confidence you know how to get this under control? Mr. Schiff, we're going to start with you. We're going to need to make sure we have a strong regulation of AI to protect the public good. Uh, we cannot afford to make the mistakes we did with social media when essentially we gave, uh, gave them free reign to do as they would with this great experiment in which we are all the subject. Uh, so we need vigorous oversight of AI. Uh, I was proud to be out there on the picket lines making sure that in these contracts for so many of the workers in the entertainment industry I represent, that they had protections against the AI uh, uh, potential threat to their jobs. We need to also uh, address these changes in the workplace uh, in the light of these new technologies Congress to make sure that workers are protected. Thank you. Your time is up. Uh, Congresswoman Lee, AI. AI can be used uh, for good. It can be used to harm people. I think it's important that right now we develop a regulatory environment so that it can be used for good. When you look at what has happened uh, with technology, for example, and look at what happened to uh, what's happening to our young people with no guardrails, we can use AI because it's here to stay to help with our climate crisis, to help with education, with health care. And also we have to be careful that it's not used to discriminate against people because there's some real issues around uh, racial justice that we have to address with AI. Lee, Now's the time you. to do it. Thank you. Mr. Garvey, should it be I regulated? See, what do you think? Yeah. Excuse me. I see AI is, is here to stay. Uh, I see it doing wonderful things in medicine. Uh, I am concerned that it's starting to eliminate jobs, white collar and blue collar jobs. And I think once that happens, it also mind altering uh, AI is starting to affect. Uh, should it our, be regulated? I believe it's, it's going to have to be regulated eventually. Because once it starts affecting you and I, and once it starts affecting Californians, uh, that's when we have to have regulation. Mr. Garvey, thank you. Katie Porter. As a lifelong consumer advocate, I can be trusted to take on the powerful interests that are backing AI. These are the same handful of ultra-wealthy billionaires who are backing ads that spread false truths about me. The touchstone ought to be safety, privacy, and competition. Um, those are the things we ought to be thinking about. And what we've got right now is none of those things. You can't make a, a toaster and put it in the marketplace and have it explode, but you can make an AI product. And people have that put it into the marketplace that reinforces racial Ms. discrimination Porter. and that is unfair Thank and you. that hurts Thank competition. You. time is up. So let's talk a little bit um, about some of the individual candidacies and your records. A couple of individual questions. Congressman Schiff, I'm going to ask you one. When you were a member of the California legislature, uh, you, again, you're a former prosecutor, you introduced a number of bills uh, that were uh, crime-related. One, from what I understand, uh, would have... Um, allowed 14-year-olds to be prosecuted as adults in some criminal cases. I believe you also uh, authored uh, a bill that would expand the three strikes law. Uh, you have said that uh, you have learned from that experience. There were people at the time who said that um, it was, it, you, you were, uh, um, that you were insensitive to uh, communities that were the subject of uh, mass incarceration. Uh, do you regret some of that legislation? I certainly wouldn't author some of the legislation again, but Conan, I'm very proud of the fact that in those same years in the 1990s, I authored, uh, along with my colleague Tony Cardenas, the Schiff Cardenas Crime Prevention Law, which has been described as, I think, one of the most successful uh, long-term juvenile justice at-risk prevention programs in the state's history. I'm very proud of that. Uh, I'm proud of the fact that in Congress I fought for criminal justice reform. I fought for body cameras uh, for police officers. Uh, and so I'm proud of my record. Um, I'm proud that ever since I was a prosecutor, the safety of neighborhoods and people uh, in my district and in California has always been my priority. Thank you. Mr. Garvey, this one is for you. For better or for worse, the U.S. Senate runs on seniority. You have committed to being a one-term senator, mm -hmm. making you a lame duck on day one. So what do you believe is going to be, like, the impact or the influence that you're going to have in the Senate for well, six I've, years? I build championship teams. I bring people together. And I've said on day one, 
will start a march to go to all 99 other senators and to meet with them and to tell them, I'm there to build consensus. I'm there to bring people together. And a dysfunctional Washington needs a leader like myself, a new face with new ideas, somebody who's willing to get up in the morning and go to bat for all the people of California. I don't think my opponents are running for all the people. They're running for half the people. But you haven't answered my question. What's going to be your impact or the legislation that you can introduce in the Senate? Well, I graduated from Michigan State uh, uh, with an education degree and uh, haven't had a chance to get to the classroom. But I think that's one of the most important things I can do is get back to reading, writing, arithmetic to make sure that the next generation of our children are the new leaders and capable. Thank you, Mr. Garvey. Ms. Lee. The increase in violent crime in Oakland has forced many residents, many people, and many businesses to leave the city, including chains like Starbucks, Denny's, and Subway. All have chosen to close some of their stores due to safety concerns. This is your district, Miss Lee, a city where our fellow journalists can't go out to work without an armed security guard to cover any story. Do you bear some responsibility, and what are you doing about it? You have 30 seconds. Public safety uh, is real in my district, throughout the state of California, and throughout the country. A couple of things we are doing now, and we must continue to do. One is working together with the federal government, state government, local government, to make sure that we have the public safety team together to really address violent crime, because police officers need to be able to address violent crime, and the team that has come together, the public safety team, are addressing the public safety issues that we're faced with right now. But we have to deal with the underlying causes of some of these crimes, and that is we have to get the guns off the streets of Oakland and of every community. We have to pass the assault weapon ban, get these AK-47s Thank off you, the Ms. street and the ghost guns off the street. I intend to fight for that in the United Thank States. You, Senate. Thank you. Congresswoman Porter, let's talk about endorsements. 27 Democratic House members have endorsed Adam Schiff. Eight have endorsed Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Based on your website, your website, which I checked just before we came on air here, you have one, one House member, Robert Garcia out of Long Beach. You've said you didn't go to Washington to make friends. Why is that a good thing when a senator really needs to work with other people to come up with legislation and to get them to vote. You have 30 seconds. I'm tremendously proud of the relationships I have with my colleagues, and they have put their trust in me, electing me deputy chair of the Progressive Caucus. That's the number two spot, the largest caucus at the time in the House Democratic um, membership. I have also been twice selected to be either a subcommittee chair or a ranking member because these chairmen, these chair people sought me out with Why regard to they endorsements. Endorse? With regard to endorsements, I would say that I'm tremendously proud to have the endorsements of folks like Attorney General Rob Bonta, State Senator but Scott these are, Wiener. These are not your colleagues. These are not people who work in the House with you on a day-to-day -day basis. These are state senators. This is the Attorney General for the state of California and Elizabeth Warren out of the Senate. Why not your colleagues? I'd have the endorsement of Robert Garcia, and I'm tremendously proud of that. And look, I have something important in common with Robert, which is I went to Congress to not be beholden to corporate special interests. I have a different position on earmarks. I, have, I don't think that we should be engaging in those special projects, for lining people's pockets. And I have had people who have powerful special interests push back. They fund these people's campaigns, I'm and it affects what they do. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Porter. You have each been in the public eye for some time now, and we all know campaigning can be pretty difficult. Is there something you've learned about yourself during this campaign? Congresswoman Lee, you have 15 seconds. What I have learned about myself during this campaign is that my uh, background and experiences and many of the obstacles that I have faced in my life, so many Californians are facing them now. And what I have learned also is that I have been able to help so many people meet these challenges, you, and I intend to do that in the United States Senate. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Mr. Schiff. What I've learned is that Californians are really looking for somebody that can work with other people to get things done. Uh, there are real problems with housing, there's real problems with child care, there's real problems with affording uh, the cost of living. Uh, and I, I guess I've found about myself mm -hmm. uh, an ability to work with others, to attract others, to, to team up together. 
uh, not just my colleagues in Congress, but Speaker Pelosi, Barbara Boxer, you, many, uh, the, the majority of statewide labor organizations. Thank you, Mr. Schiff. And that's an important skill for the Senate. Mr. Garvey. People around the state have come up to me and said, Steve, thank you. Uh, bless you. Uh, thank you for running. Uh, we need you. Career politicians have failed us. Uh, we need a new voice back in Washington, in the Senate. We trust you. Uh, we put our life in your hands. But what have you learned about yourself during the campaign? I started this campaign uh, because uh, I believe in the people. I love my state. Uh, I want to represent all the people of California, and I'll be relentless in the pursuit of that. Mr. Garvey, we'll, we'll start with you. This is time for a wrap-up. I didn't up yeah. to respond to the question Ms. at all. Porter, Ms. Porter, your Sorry. time. Thank you. Um, I would say that what I have learned about myself is that institutional Washington, which serves itself, doesn't want to change very much. Um, and that we have seen this with big, dark money, even here in California, the greatest democracy in the United States, flooding the airways with lies. Thank you, Ms. Porter. So, uh, closing statements, you have 45 seconds. This is the last debate before the primary election. Mr. Garvey, go ahead. Well, to the Latino community, thank you for the currency of friendship all the years. Um, to all the people of California, um, this has been a journey. But if you feel the quality of your life is the same now that it was three years ago, if you believe there this crime in the streets that is relentless, if you believe that the, uh, the crisis at the border uh, is real, if you believe that inflation is stifling uh, your family, uh, then I want you to vote for me. I want you to go to stevegarvey.com. And you know in your heart. And tonight was a night where I'm putting my heart and soul into your mind and body because I want to represent you for six years. Thank you, Mr. Garvey. Congresswoman Lee, 45 seconds. Well, thank you for uh, inviting us to be with you again. Thank you to the voters who have uh, watched this debate. I think it's important to know that uh, I know what it takes to make life better uh, for everyone in California. I have faced so many obstacles, such as being on public assistance, such as foods, being on food stamps, not being able to afford childcare, having to take my children to class with me. I know the 20 million people who are living one paycheck away from poverty. I know, I see you, I want to work for you in the United States Senate to make life better for you. I know what it takes to fix our democracy and to protect our democracy. I know what it takes to protect our reproductive freedom, and I'm so proud that Reproductive Freedom for All has endorsed me in this campaign because our de democratic rights are being taken away. Thank, Thank you again. You. Uh, please vote for Barbara Lee at Thank CA. You, Thank, Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, Congressman Schiff, final statement. Senator Feinstein was a giant in the state uh, because she had the ability to take on the big fights, but she also had the ability to get things done. She took on the NRA and we got an assault weapons ban. Uh, she worked with people throughout the state of the California to deliver for Californians everywhere. This is what I'm gonna bring to the Senate. Uh, Senator Feinstein was a good example of the fact that you've got talkers and you've got doers. She was a doer, she got things done. Uh, for the Imperial Valley, I want to make sure the mineral wealth of the Imperial Valley helps people in the Imperial Valley. For people in the Central Valley, I want to make sure they have dr water they can drink. I want to make sure farm workers can have a path to citizenship. I want to make sure those in the north of the state are protected from wildfare and have access to rural health care and broadband. I want to be a senator for all Californians, and that's what I will be. Thank you, Congressman. Congresswoman Porter, your final comments. Californians, you don't have to choose between having a career uh, politician who's beholden to special interests and having someone who simply doesn't have a lot of ideas or experience at all. I can give you an example of how I've delivered results without ever being beholden. During the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, when we were scared and we had no resources, just at home watching a graph of rising cases, I went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Trump's top public health official, and I got him to promise free COVID testing for every single American, regardless of immigration status, regardless of health insurance. That saved lives. You can have results without having a career politician who does Washington, uh, corporate, Washington's corporate agenda's bidding. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Porter. Time's up for all of us at this point. Thanks so much for joining us tonight here on NBC4 and Telemundo 52. Special thank you to our partner at LMU. We hope the conversation here with the candidates offered you some clarity this evening. Keep in mind, the um, primary is two weeks out.
your vote counts. coffee giveaway at Corridor Flow in Lomita. Love this turnout here. Hi guys. Yeah, our friends from Telemundo 52. Traffic always keeps me ahead so I can make sure I'm always early to work. The weather is uh, curious. These are my kids. They learn high and low pressure from Belen. <laughs> you make people feel comfortable. It feels like family, honestly. Friendly faces. Yeah, friendly faces in the morning. These guys are dancing. A lot of energy and it's something that, okay, now I can conquer the world. Cheers. Gracias, Lomita. Everybody cares about the weather. Yeah. That's something that matters to every single person. Yeah, it's more than the numbers. It's more than the forecast. I want to connect with our viewers. We're in it with them, so it is personal. Seven years in a row, the most accurate forecast. Hello. It says a lot about our team and that we're a team that people can trust. Whenever the weather goes south, now it's not just about planning your day, it's about potentially saving lives. So we want to make sure that our viewers feel prepared to keep themselves and their families safe. One of the things I love that you do is use our augmented reality to explain some really cool weather phenomena. Oh my gosh, it's one of the coolest things we get to do. It's so different from what you've seen, but... Decision 2024, with California's open Senate seat in the spotlight. Tonight, the four candidates sparring with each other for the last time before Super Tuesday. The border crisis. We're never going to get the help from the Republicans. Uh, Mr. Garvey's party believes that this is a political gift that we'll never stop giving. They're not going to help us with this. Cost of living. People are working two and three jobs just to pay rent, just to afford child care. We have to think about and talk about a living wage. And conflicts around the world taking center stage. National defense is our single most important issue. Without that, everything else is irrelevant. The United States should be a beacon for freedom, for democracy, and for human rights. That's the touchstone that should guide our foreign policy. And in just two weeks, the top two finishers will qualify for the general election in November. That third and final debate just wrapped up. Good evening from our home here in Universal City. I'm Carolyn Johnson. And I'm Michael Brownlee. The top four candidates are vying for the seat Diane Feinstein held for the last 30 years. We have a full hour of analysis from our political experts, reaction from students and voters, and we expect to hear from each of the candidates. And we want to hear from you, too. You can scan the QR code on your screen. Tell us who you think won tonight's debate and why. And you can also comment on social media using the hashtag decision. 2024. We may share your comments on air later in this broadcast. All right, folks, we have live team coverage tonight, starting with Sonia Diaz with the UCLA Latina Futures Lab. Sonia, thank you for your time here tonight. So happy to be here. So entertaining. Let, all right, let's <laughs> jump right in. What were your impressions of the debate here tonight? Do you think anything we heard will change the state of this race? Well, I think there were a few things. First, you know, Schiff, all he had to do was just maintain. He's been leading this race from all the polls, whether it was Emerson's that came out um, today, or it was the Institute of Governmental Studies at Berkeley. Now, the real kind of debate here was between Representative Porter and Steve Garvey. They're both vying for the second spot in November's ballot. What we saw in terms of tactics were twofold. One, uh, Steve Garvey talked about his wonderful Latino friends um, through his career as a baseball player for the Dodgers. We saw conversely Representative Porter from the very first question go after Representative Schiff. And, and that was the tactic. She really needs to show that there's a difference. Um, she is, uh, has substantive disagreements with Representative Schiff. The other thing to note I think was really interesting is Representative Lee um, caught her bearings when she started doing personal stories. She talked about being from El Paso. She talked about environmental injustices and then obviously showed her dexterity as it relates to war and defense issues. Sonia, we're going to hear much more from you in just a minute, but right now we want to get to Colleen and Conan on the debate stage. 
All right, Carolyn, and uh, we're sitting here with Congressman Adam Schiff, who, uh, as you pointed out, is the front runner in all the polls. Your takeaway from the debate tonight, how do you think you did? I think I did great, but I'm, I'm a little biased, <laughs> uh, but I, I enjoyed it. The moderators were, of course, excellent. Yeah, thanks. So uh, let me ask you uh, one question we didn't ask. You were the... Um, Donald Trump hates you the most of any member of the House of Representatives or in, in Congress. He tweets about you all the time. I know you've said that's a badge of honor. But some say, listen, if for a senator to get anything done, you need to convince 50 other people, sometimes 59 other people, uh, to side with you on a piece of legislation. How much of a burden uh, is, is, you, is the problems that you've had in the past with the Republican Party in the, in the Congress? How much of a burden would that be yeah, in the Senate? Uh, first of all, uh, it is a badge of honor to stand up to Donald Trump. And the thing about Trump is he ignores you uh, if he thinks you're ineffective. The people he thinks are effective to standing up to him are the ones that he goes after. Uh, so he goes after me a lot. Uh, but, but here's the thing. Even during the worst of the Trump years, when our democracy was hanging by a thread, uh, and I was in constant fights with him, um, I was still able to work with the Republican Devin Nunes on the Intelligence Committee to get our intelligence bills passed because we decided we would fight over Russia and Ukraine and the president's corruption, but we would get the work of the intelligence community done, and we did. Uh, through those years, I worked with the Republican uh, Texan and conservative John Culberson to fund NASA and space science. Uh, I have worked with Republicans to build mass transit to get open space bills passed. You have to be able to compartmentalize, and I think actually the Senate is a place where that kind of work is, is much easier to do. Uh, there's a more, more of a history of working across the aisle, often in private. Uh, in fact, even during the impeachment trials, uh, I had Republicans come up to me to tell me what a great job I was doing. Uh, and uh, they didn't vote the right way, right. Not, not all but one, but nevertheless, you have to compartmentalize. That's what I've done in the past. That's what I'll do in the Senate. We talked about aid being sent overseas. We talked about Ukraine. We talked about Israel, uh, Hamas. What would you say to Armenians in your uh, district right now who feel like they're being overlooked with all this going on in the world? Well, I totally understand where they're coming from, uh, and I feel they have been overlooked. Um, I have been weighing in day after day, week after week, year after year with this administration and previous administrations to push back against that murderous dictator in Baku, Aliyev. Um, I warned that we could see exactly what took place, the ethnic cleansing of Artsakh, if the United States kept talking in morally equivalent terms, and sadly, that's what happened. Uh, but I, I certainly understand the, the deep frustration uh, and anger within the community. Can you that do the something for them when you get into the U.S. Senate? Uh, I mean, will you carry that in? Absolutely. Well, look, I, I've been their champion in the House. I will be their champion in the Senate. Um, and they desperately need a champion in the Senate. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, we're going to now talk to one of your opponents, uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. That's an outrage. That, that's a <laughs> Democrat from Oakland, Alameda County, uh, who was the former chair of the, uh, of the Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, thank you very much, and I do appreciate it. Thank you. Great thank to you. see you. Take care. Uh, so if we could bring in uh, Congresswoman Lee. Um, she's somewhere around here. Well, uh, in Let's go back to the studio. We'll, oh, here she comes right here. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, so uh, t tell us about your, your sense of this debate tonight. Well, you guys were great. <laughs> and no. I thought it was Thank really <laughs> very thorough. And I think that um, voters probably could get a sense of who we are, where uh, we're similar, and where we're not. And uh, oftentimes, and I was surprised you guys didn't answer the question uh, in terms of our similarities, because there are similarities on voting every now and then are the same. But there are a lot of uh, areas where we're just not similar at all. And Such I as. hope that the voters were able to see it. Well, I think just in terms of background, experience, uh, for instance, being able to, um, of course, uh, as a woman of color, see and, and have a perspective that is unique for the United States Senate. I mean, since 1789, there have only been three black women serving in a total of 10 years. And so perspective is important. And being able to represent people in California, everyone, uh, I believe it's important to have representation. Representation really matters. R right. You have a, there is a split in your party over Gaza. And, and the backing of Israel. Uh, you, you said, listen, the Israeli government needs to, in, to declare an immediate ceasefire. 
No questions asked. Just do it now. Stop the fighting. That separates you from your opponents, all three of them. But let me just say, I've condemned Hamas and over and over we, again. We know that, but we're and, talking about going forward. Right now, stop forward, the fight. We have to have a permanent ceasefire so that we can first uh, make sure that Israel is secure. But you know what is taking place? Uh, the anger, the catastrophic humanitarian disaster is creating a less secure a less secure Israel. It's counterproductive to Israel's security. Would you tie aid to Israel to that notion that of an immediate ceasefire? We have to make sure that aid to Israel is conditioned. There are certain standards of, of warfare that have to be uh, adhered to. There are humanitarian and uh, human rights issues that have to be addressed, like with any country. When you provide um, money and investments in other countries, there are certain regulations and conditions that have to be met. And now what we're seeing, uh, and everyone sees this, is, this is a catastrophe. Again, it's counterproductive to Israel's security. It does not right, lead to a path to a solution. What we're seeing also is a regional war that's about right. to break out. Yeah. I warned after 9-11 that it was going to spiral out of control then. We're seeing that now. And the only pathway to security and peace for the Israelis and the Palestinians is a political and diplomatic solution with all of the Arab nations and, right. in fact, right. supporting a two-state solution, yep. which Netanyahu does not support. Right. That's the policy yep. of the United States. All right, we are going to send it back to the studio. We thank you for your time tonight and appreciate you being here. Thank you. Good luck to you, Congresswoman. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Thanks. Hey, uh, Colleen and uh, Conan, while we got you, we have our uh, expert Sonia Diaz here with the UCLA Latina Futures Lab. And she said that, uh, you know, Barbara Lee really began to hit it out of the park, began to gain, gain traction when she talked about personal stories growing up in El Paso, living on public assistance at one point in time. She said that Adam Schiff here tonight had to do nothing but simply maintain. Was he successful? I think so. Uh, you, you know, the... Um he has a lead by every poll. There's no question about that. And it's, it's, you know, indicative of a candidate who's leading not to say anything that's going to uh, endanger that lead. And I don't think he did anything tonight that would somehow cause people who are supporting him to think twice about that support. Barbara Lee, on the other hand, she's polling in the single digits. She needed to move the needle quite a bit. Um, and as did uh, Katie Porter. Uh, who, uh, interestingly enough, made reference to somebody not on the stage tonight. That's a Republican named Eric Early, who's polling at about in low single digits, like 2%. She, she mentioned him because she's hoping that Republicans will vote for him and bring down the Republican vote for Steve Garvey so that she makes it into the runoff and Steve Garvey doesn't make it into the runoff for the fall. So a lot of politics being played here tonight. You talk about um, Democrats being split, the party being split, Republicans the same thing. A lot of people want Steve Garvey on the record as to who he will support in this election um, when it comes out, and he didn't bite tonight. R right, and we understand where he's coming from, and it, it's a perfectly legitimate thing to say I'm going to take a look at you know, the elections in nine you know in months from now uh, the, the problem though is that um, again his candidacy is one where if he rallies enough Republicans he can actually make one of the top two spots in fact there's a possibility he could come in first if all the Republicans in the state rallied around him that would be really problematic for Katie Porter because once again she's hoping to make the, pl the runoff in the fall, Adam Schiff would love Steve Garvey to be the, his, can't, his opponent in the fall because that would pretty much wrap up the election. And just as you anticipated going into the debate, the real heated exchanges came between um, Congressman Schiff and Katie Porter. Correct. Uh, she needs to bring his numbers down. I don't know if that happened tonight. All right, back to you in the studio. Colleen and Conan, it's interesting because during the debate, we received a number of emails from Adam Schiff's office, sort of fact-checked emails, and then the most recent one that came through just a short time ago says, and this is from Adam Schiff's press office, Adam Schiff wins final California U.S. Senate primary debate. So. <laughs> That's their opinion. We do want to hear from our viewers on that as well. So. That's right. We want to check in now with uh, Lolita Lopez. She's live for us in Linwood and getting a reaction from the voters here at a watch party. Lolita, what are they saying? 
Well, Michael and Carolyn, we saw a lot of head nods and head shakes during this hour-long conversation right here live on NBC Channel 4. And what we learned from them is they were listening intently but also taking intense notes. Now, this is an important community of Southeast Los Angeles, a heavy Latino community, Latino voters being courted and also a growing population in here in L.A. County if they come out to vote, which is why this event was taking place. I have with me from Sela Collaborative, the host of this event, Dr. Wilma Franco, and it's an important group of people here that can come out to vote. What did you hear that really affects your community? I think one of the things that we heard was really around living wages, right? So one of the things um, that I heard a specific candidate mention was around the cost of childcare, right? Like none of us, and as a single mom, like I truly understand that aspect, right? Like, you know, oftentimes it feels like you're paying a second mortgage just to make sure that your children are being taken care of. Um, so I think that was important. I think the other piece that was really just critical to the Southeast is the conversation around immigration and DACA students. So we have a large population of DACA students, and I think, you know, it's sad to hear that we're still having these conversations conversations because this conversations about dreamers have been things that even I worked on when I was at UCLA and this is all to feel like you know you know to almost 20 years we're still having these conversations our community deserves better our students deserve better and I think it's time for us to actually really create a path to citizenship and I know Sela has a really big campaign on trying to get out the vote what do you hope that people here take back to their own homes and communities yeah so I think for us is really trying to educate communities so we're so grateful to you know to your network to Telemundo to uh, the partners right to really um, creating the space, right, because it's needed uh, for us to be able to engage in these conversations, learn about the candidates, but then also go home and really encourage our families to get out the vote. And, you know, the one thing we have known is that CELAV does vote, and that's really our focus for this campaign is to continue to encourage our community to get out. Dr. Franco, thank you so very much. Stella Calabrese here being host to this event in Linwood, one of many watch parties that we were at. These folks taking this back. I know in Latino communities, I know in my own household, we sit around the dining room table around some food, talk about what we heard, and this is likely what these folks are going to do tonight and in the coming days before the primary. Sending it back to you in the studio. All right, Lolita, live for us there in Linwood. We appreciate it. Thank you. We're also keeping a close eye on what's going on on the debate floor. Carmen Dickerson is at Loyola Marymount University now with reaction from some students there who watched the debate closely. Karma. Hi there. It was a pretty lively debate at times here at LMU. You could definitely tell the students were engaged, that they were listening. They were certainly reacting. We had some applause at times. We had some laughter at times. So we want to check in with some of those students, hearing what some of the things that they were saying. This is Athena Mahajani. What year are you? I'm a junior. Okay. And what are you studying? Economics. Now, Athena, you were watching this entire debate closely. Curious, what do you think? Um, I thought it was great to see uh, their different perspectives on things, especially um, related to international relations and the climate. Um, I thought I learned a lot about the candidates. Now, I do know that you did have a question that you did want to ask the candidates if you had an option. What would you have asked them? I would have asked um, their plan to combat the affordable housing crisis and make home, home ownership possible for our generation um, after we graduate and start working, um, especially with the high cost of living. Now, did you learn anything new this debate? I did, yeah. I thought, um, especially in, in regard to um, international relations with uh, the Ukraine situation and the situation um, in the Middle East. Uh, I learned a lot about their perspectives and I feel much more educated. All right, thank you so much, Athena. So we've continued to talk with some students who are going to continue to hear more from them. But the bottom line is everyone we talked to said that they learned something new from this debate and would help them make decisions going forward. I'll send it back to you. Karma, wonderful to see engaged young yeah. voters. Thank you. All right, we want to toss it back now to Colleen and Conan, who have Congresswoman Katie Porter in their presence. Hey, guys. Yes, we do. She just uh, popped over here. Uh, we want to talk to you a little bit about the debate. Um, things that stood out in your mind tonight. Well, I thought there were some clear contrasts. I think there's been a little bit of a sense of all Democrats are created equal, and I think tonight exposed some of the ways that we're different. Um, you know, I haven't been in Congress for 25 or 30 years, I, and I've seen kind of over that time, my adult lifetime, some of the most important challenges facing families, like housing affordability, climate change, childcare costs, Washington immigration reform, Washington hasn't tackled those. So I think it's, it's important that people get a chance to hear why career politicians who haven't gotten that done think they deserve a promotion. And I also was happy to highlight why I'm a little bit different in terms of never having taken corporate PAC money and not being bought by special interests. Can, can we uh, uh, spend a, a second on the politics of the top two system? I mean, it, it's a little inside baseball, but Adam Schiff has been spending money designed to elevate 
uh, Steve Garvey's position within the Republican Party so that he'll be his opponent in the fall. And with a two to one registration advantage in California, that's a surefire win for him. Uh, you criticized that initially. Now you're, you even mentioned Eric Early, another Republican, very conservative, hoping obviously to bring down Steve Garvey's numbers. Uh, is, this, um, is this a flaw in the system where Democrats are now trying to pump up a Republican so you can drag him with you to the, to the fall campaign and ensure your victory? Well, the situations are not the same. Candidates' campaigns should be about honesty and about being truthful. And the truth is, and you heard it for yourselves tonight, Steve Garvey is not 100% behind Donald Trump. And that's what Mr. Schiff, to the tune of millions of millions of dollars, is telling California voters. Eric Early, on the other hand, as you yourself admit, is an unabashed MAGA conservative. He will deliver a nationwide abortion ban. He will be rapid He's in his He's polling at 2%, though. Amendment. The race is two weeks to go, and we have seen changes in the polling of 10% or more in the last few weeks. For people who are not quite sure what they're voting for here, what is the job of a U.S. senator, and what can you do? I mean, California sends billions to Washington. What can you do to bring some of that back into the state? Especially if you want to get rid of earmarks. Yeah. So, look, for too long, California's biggest challenges, climate resilience, housing affordability, the costs of child care, have not been on the top of Washington's agenda. And that is because corporate special interests, big oil, big banks, big pharma, we spend too much of the time passing laws that benefit them. Let me use child care as an example. Every single economist, from the far right to the far left, Democrat, Republican, will say that if the government would help make child care more affordable, our economy would grow. That is a win for Democrats and Republicans. With regard to bringing home resources, in the Senate, an earmark system deeply, deeply disadvantages California. We get two senators, and yet we, are, we will get 2% of the earmarks, and yet we are 12% of California's population. And you don't have to take my word for it. Look who got the biggest earmarks last Congress in the Senate. It was states like Alabama. Thank you very much. Congress Thank you. Order. Back to you. Oops. I'm gonna... Back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Colleen. You Sorry, I'm not used to that. It's a, a fluid Zoom, set. Right? Exactly. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I can't tell who's on there. Thank you for stopping me. Oh. Thank you so much. Well, our coverage of the last Senate debate continues right after this break with reaction from voters. And we asked you to join the conversation on social media using the hashtag Decision2024. And here are just some of the comments we've received so far. giveaway at board or flow in Lomita. Love this turnout here. Hi guys. Yeah. Our friends from Telemundo 52. Traffic always keeps me ahead so I can make sure I'm always early to work. The weather is accurate. Uh, These are my kids. They learn high and low pressure from Belen. <laughs> you make people feel comfortable. It feels like family, honestly. Friendly faces. Yeah, friendly faces in the morning. These guys are dancing. A lot of energy and it's something that, okay, now I can conquer the world. Cheers. Gracias, Lomita. Everybody cares about the weather. Yeah. That's something that matters to every single person. Yeah, it's more than the numbers. It's more than the forecast. I want to connect with our viewers. We're in it with them, so it is personal. Seven years in a row, the most accurate forecast. Hello. It says a lot about our team and that we're a team that people can trust. Whenever the weather goes south, now it's not just about planning your day. It's about potentially saving lives. So we want to make sure that our viewers feel prepared to keep themselves and their families safe. One of the things I love that you do is use our augmented reality to explain some really cool weather phenomena. Oh my gosh, it's one of the coolest things we get to do. It's so different from what you've seen, but I think that that really helps you better understand what we're trying to explain. Because then you have an idea of, oh 
yeah, I can see that. You met the love of your life working here at yes. NBC4. Yes, we ended up getting married here in Southern California, and the forecast for that was a perfect day. <laughs> I was just going to ask I you about that. I nailed that forecast. Shano, why? A live look now from our home here in Universal City. Our post-debate coverage continues, and we are hearing from more students tonight. That's right. Let's get to NBC4's Kristen Casadas live at UCLA with reaction from students and staff who watched this debate together. Hey, Christian. That's right. I can tell you these UCLA students were very difficult to read. We were watching them, watching the debate from all the way in the back of the room, and I can tell you they had very little reaction to the debate. Many of them just taking down notes on their notepads or on their phones. Now, we did get a chance to talk to several of them before the debate started, and they tell us they had so many questions. They were asking questions about who these candidates were and what they represented. So I want to show you here a live look here at this room here. Now, we are inside the LA Tennis Center here at the UCLA campus. Now, this watch party was organized by the Division of Campus Life and Bruins Vote. And I can tell you about two dozen students attended this watch party tonight. Now, this is part of the Democracy Workshop Series, which organizers tell me they really focus to prepare the campus for 2024 and beyond. But like I said, we did get a chance to talk to several students before, two of them right here, and we're going to be talking to them right now. Now, we were talking to you earlier. You told us that several things were um, issues that were mattering to you, uh, health care, education, cost of living. How satisfied were you today with the answers from the candidates? I was very happy that the first question was about the cost of living and the cost of education. And I really feel that, um, that the priority for making sure education stays affordable is incredibly important to almost all, all the candidates that we're running, and especially with going to a public school in California, making sure that that stays affordable for California residents and making sure that stays affordable across nationally. And I'm really happy that all the candidates were able to address that. You were telling me before that uh, you weren't really sure as to who you were going to be voting for. Did tonight help you with that problem? Tonight really helped. Um, the candidate I'm thinking about voting for really, I think, really answered a lot of the questions I had and um, spoke to a lot of um, positions that I think were really important to me personally. And as a freshman, obviously, this is very important to you. Now, we also have a junior here who we were talking to earlier. Um, give me your first and last name again. Uh, I'm Victoria Takach. So we were talking about how representation is very important for you. Um, talk to me a little bit about what you saw out there tonight on stage. How satisfied were you? Oh, um, I was satisfied, yeah, I was satisfied in terms of, there were women on stage, which is nice, but um, as a Latina, you know, there is like a representation in that, there was only one, P, like, POC on stage, person of color, um, and it was just not very representative of, like, California summer graphics itself, um, you were also telling me that the big homework here is that you get to now go home and help your family uh, make a, a, a very uh, educated decision here moving forward in terms of who they're going to vote for. That's a lot of pressure. So it is, but that, that yeah. Carry back home, right? Yeah, there was a lot of topics covered that I have to go and relay. Um, since my family isn't as like as involved with this, but I still want to get them to vote and to like use like this right that they have. Um, and oh uh, yeah, it's just going to be a lot to go through all these candidates and just speak to them on that. And we should mention that both of these students here, it's their first time voting, so it's a very exciting time here for these students here at UCLA. Of course, they're telling me that they're doing their homework. They're trying to figure out who these candidates are, what they stand for, what issues they stand for. And of course, the other issue that they were telling me about is where they are going to vote. That's the next part of this conversation. Where on campus do they vote? Where can they go to vote in person or uh, by mail? So of course, a lot of questions here, but that's the very latest here from UCLA. I'll send it back over to you in the studio. All right, Christian, thank you. And oftentimes we wonder whether debates like this actually move the needle or not, but it seems as if at least with one of those students, it has. Yeah, in yeah. indeed. All right. Our coverage of the last Senate debate continues later this hour. Of course, our other top story we're following tonight is the weather as that storm moves through Southern California. Meteorologist Melissa McGee has more for us. Melissa. And Carolyn, a first alert radar network still tracking some light and scattered activity across the region. The heaviest has moved out for now, but we are tracking one more batch that moves things first thing tomorrow morning. So we'll have details on that coming up with your first alert forecast.
coffee giveaway at Corridor Flow in Lomita. Love this turnout here. Hi, guys. Yeah, our friends from Telemundo 52. Traffic always keeps me ahead so I can make sure I'm always early to work. The weather is accurate. Uh, These are my kids. They learn high and low pressure from Belen. <laughs> you make people feel comfortable. It feels like family, honestly. Friendly faces. Yeah, friendly faces in the morning. These guys are dancing. A lot of energy, and it's something that, okay, now I can conquer the world. Cheers. Gracias, Lomita. Everybody cares about the weather. Yeah. That's something that matters to every single person. Yeah, it's more than the numbers. It's more than the forecast. I want to connect with our viewers. We're in it with them, so it is personal. Seven years in a row, the most accurate forecast. Hello. It says a lot about our team and that we're a team that people can trust. Whenever the weather goes south, now it's not just about planning your day, it's about potentially saving lives. So we want to make sure that our viewers feel prepared to keep themselves and their families safe. One of the things I love that you do is use our augmented reality to explain some really cool weather phenomena. Oh my gosh, it's one of the coolest things we get to do. It's so different from what you've seen, but I think that that really helps you better understand what we're trying to explain. Because then you have an idea of, oh yeah, I can see that. You met the love of your life working here at yes. NBC4. Yes, we ended up getting married here in Southern California, and the forecast for that was a perfect day. <laughs> I was just going to ask I you about that. I nailed that forecast. NBC4 tracking the storm moving through Southern California right now. Yeah, many of you are getting a break here right now with some scattered showers and the potential for thunderstorms the rest of tonight. We want to bring you outside right now. This is a live look at LAX where it appears to be clearing there. Let's bring in meteorologist Melissa McGee with the very latest. And Carolyn and Michael, yes, yeah, we look at the first alert radar network, you can see a lot of the activity really starting to thin out across our region. We do have a couple of pockets right now popping up across areas in Ventura as well as LA County but some showers right now right along that San Bernardino Riverside County border. So you can see that moisture in Riverside up through Moreno Valley and Yucaipa right along the 10 kind of sandwiched in between Yucaipa and Loma Linda at this hour. But all in all, we will stay fairly quiet for the rest of tonight until one more round moves in overnight and first thing tomorrow morning. Rain we've seen so far over the past three days, Ventura County and in Ventura, we've seen 4.36 inches of rain, Bel Air 4.28, Porter Ranch almost 4 Four inches for you, two and a half inches in Pasadena, and 1.78 inches of rain there in Chino. So we want to show you the big picture as we look at satellite and radar. There's a lot of moisture moving right across areas in Southern California here. And if you could see the strip of activity, this is actually that atmospheric river that kind of comes in from the Pacific. All of this trop uh, tropical moisture working its way into Southern California. That is what we have been dealing with, and it pretty much stalled out across areas in LA County. And today it shifted out across areas in Orange County and the IE. So we'll time it out for you as we go throughout the rest of our night and into our overnight hours. For the rest of tonight, some light and scattered activity. Then we're tracking the potential of some showers and some convective activity, meaning some thunderstorms moving through as you wake up very early Wednesday morning. Then after that, look at this. As we get into 5 a.m., we've got some clouds around, some spotty showers from time to time. There will be some slow clearing as we get into our Wednesday afternoon and even some pockets of sunshine. Talking a lot about the rain, but also some snow well above 7,000 feet. So there we are anticipating 5 to 10 inches of snow. Uh, levels could fall tonight and into early tomorrow morning to about 5,500 feet. Just a couple of inches expected with that. But always a reminder when you're dealing with snow and slick conditions, reduce your visibility and allow some extra time. No impacts, thankfully, for the grapevine as well because your snow level is about 4,100, 4,000 feet. So you are staying dry. Just slick out there. Here's your forecast for the basin and at 63 62 for our coastal spots. We will dry out on the second half of our day tomorrow. Then look at this Thursday and Friday temperatures in the upper 60s, lower 70s. Great start to our weekend. Uh, more clouds will start to develop as we get into Saturday night and Sunday. The chance of some showers moving in looks pretty light in nature, but of course we'll keep you posted one system at a time. 63 degrees tomorrow for the valley 62 for the Inland Empire. We've got more sunshine on the way as we get into our Thursday. Great looking day on Friday, 74 for the valleys, 73 degrees for the Inland Empire. Mostly cloudy start for our weekend, then those showers will arrive as we get into late Sunday into our Monday. High desert, 59 degrees for you. More sun as you get into your Thursday and Friday. Once this moisture moves on out for the low desert, look at this on Friday, 76, 77 for the start of your weekend on Saturday and 76 as we get into our Sunday here. Mountains 39, a chance of some rain and snow showers well above 7,000 feet here. But then as we get into Thursday, more sun 
45 and 50 degrees for you on your Friday. That is your forecast. I'll send it back over your way. All right, Melissa, thank you. As the heavy rain continues to hammer parts of Southern California, this has been the scene in many neighborhoods around the region. This is video from Upland. Periods of heavy rain creating hazardous conditions for drivers all day. And take a look at this in Ventura County. Yes, a funnel cloud in the Santa Paula area. This was around four this afternoon. The National Weather Service says this was not a tornado. It did not touch the ground and there were no reports of any damage. All right, now to Encino, another area bracing for the second round of rain on already saturated ground. NBC 4 is Macy Jenkins checking things out for us there. Hey, Macy. Hi, Michael and Carolyn. Well, we've learned from our NBC4 weather team that Encino got about two and a half inches of rain on this round alone. Now, like you said, the ground is already saturated from what we saw just a few weeks ago earlier in February. Take a look here. We are on Boris Drive, and this is a result of a landslide that happened on February 5th that caused this home and another one nearby to be red tagged. That means no one can go inside the ground, of course, impacted. If you will zoom in here, I'll have my photographer, Susan Monroe, kind of just take a look at all of this. This was a driveway, and now it is covered in mud and debris. No one can go in and out of this home. Now, here's a look at an aerial view from News Chopper 4 of the damage to that second home that was just around the corner from this one over on Gable Drive. You can see the chunks of the hillside that came tumbling down into the backyard of this home here on Boris. The concern now that more rain could affect even more homes. Now, I spoke to Daryl Friedman tonight on the phone. He says he grew up in the Gable Drive home and his mother, Majel, lived there until she died two years ago. The family then sold the home to a developer who had plans to build two homes on that one acre lot. The family saddened to see what happened that the home is now red tagged in their neighborhood of 46 years. Take a listen. Um, looking at it uh, on TV, I, I said, gosh, that's, mom, that's mom's house. That's mom's house and called my wife over and, and it was just devastating. It was, it was amazing to see. We were, we were just shocked by all the damage. We just felt lucky that if she had, were still alive and had been living in that house, how scary that would have been for her and, and shocking and, uh, and difficult to deal with. We've said this before, but another reminder to any homeowner experiencing damage from the storm, take plenty of pictures and go ahead and take that survey, that damage assessment survey on LACity.gov. Reporting live in Encino tonight, Macy Jenkins, NBC4 News. All right, Macy, thank you for that. Our coverage of the final Senate debate continues, and we've been asking viewers to use this QR code to tell us who they think won this debate and folks you have delivered. We have received hundreds of comments here tonight. Jose from Beaumont says Katie Porter won the debate because she set herself apart from career politicians or newcomers. Jackie from Woodland Hills thinks Adam Schiff won because he is buttoned up, smart, knowledgeable. We thank you for your responses. We'll be right back. at Ford or Flow in Lomita. Love this turnout here. Hi, guys. Yeah, our friends from Telemundo 52. Traffic always keeps me ahead so I can make sure I'm always early to work. The weather is uh, curious. These are my kids. They learn high and low pressure from Belen. <laughs> you make people feel comfortable. It feels like family, honestly. Friendly faces. Yeah, friendly faces in the morning. These guys are dancing. A lot of energy, and it's something that, okay, now I can conquer the world. Cheers. Gracias, Lomita. Everybody cares about the weather. Yeah. That's something that matters to every single person. Yeah, it's more than the numbers. It's more than the forecast. I want to connect with our viewers. We're in it with them, so it is personal. Seven years in a row, the most accurate forecast. Hello. It says a lot about our team and that we're a team that people can trust. Whenever the weather goes south, now it's not just about planning your day. It's about potentially saving lives. So we want to make sure that our viewers feel prepared to keep themselves and their families safe. 
One of the things I love that you do is use our augmented reality to explain some really cool weather phenomena. Oh my gosh, it's one of the coolest things we get to do. It's so different from what you've seen, but I think that that really helps you better understand what we're trying to explain. Because then you have an idea of, oh yeah, I can see that. You met the love of your life working here at yes. NBC4. Yes, we ended up getting married here in Southern California, and the forecast for that was a perfect day. <laughs> I was just going to ask I you about that. I nailed that forecast. One person died, two others were injured in a car crash in Encino, and the driver we're learning was a 14-year-old girl. NBC4's Darsha Phillips live for us in Encino with video from the rescue. Darsha. Michael, Carolyn, this crash happened here on Ventura and Balboa Boulevards just after midnight. And as you mentioned, the driver, just 14 years old, she crashed into a traffic pole and that car burst into flames. Seconds later, LAPD officers were on scene doing whatever they could to save the victims. And it was all caught on camera. Take a look. These the are These are the intense and heartbreaking moments as LAPD officers and a witness try to desperately get the teens out of that burning car. Police say officers saw the vehicle driving without its headlights on, attempted to stop the car, but the driver took off. The officers did not pursue the vehicle, but then moments later saw that it had crashed into a traffic pole on Ventura and Balboa Boulevards. LAPD officers pulled the 14-year-old driver and her 18-year-old passenger from the wreckage. But there was another passenger, a 16-year-old girl trapped in the back seat. Witness Howard Raishbrook saw the entire thing unfold and even tried to help put out the fire. I heard uh, LAPD said he didn't see anybody in the back seat. And honestly, I'm not surprised because there was, there was so much smoke and fire. I mean, all you can do is, is hope that no one's in the back seat. And then uh, the female that had been pulled out said, uh, you know, there's maybe someone else inside. I'm thinking, okay, this isn't good. Now, Howard says he and the officers tried to get to the teen in the back seat, but the flames and the heat were just too intense. The victim, again, just 16 years old, did not make it out of that car alive. Now, the 14-year-old driver and the 18-year-old passenger, we are told, are recovering at a hospital. It is not clear where they were going or why the 14-year-old was driving the car or what charges that young driver may face. Reporting live tonight from Encino, I'm Darsha Phillips, NBC4 News. Darsha, thank you. And our coverage of the final Senate debate continues, and we've been asking you to join the conversation on social media using the hashtag Decision2024. And in fact, we have received hundreds of responses. Here's a look at some of those comments, and we'll be right back. coffee giveaway at corridor flow in lomita love this turnout here hi guys yeah our friends from telemundo 52 traffic always keeps me ahead so i can make sure i'm always early to work the weather is accurate uh, these are my kids they learn high and low pressure from belen <laughs> you make people feel comfortable it feels like family honestly friendly faces. yeah friendly faces in the morning these guys are dancing a lot of energy and it's something that okay now i can conquer the world cheers Gracias, lomita. Everybody cares about the weather. Yeah. That's something that matters to every single person. Yeah, it's more than the numbers. It's more than the forecast. I want to connect with our viewers. We're in it with them, so it is personal. Seven years in a row, the most accurate forecast. Hello. It says a lot about our team and that we're a team that people can trust. Whenever the weather goes south, now it's not just about 
planning your day. It's about potentially saving lives. So we want to make sure that our viewers feel prepared to keep themselves and their families safe. One of the things I love that you do is use our augmented reality to explain some really cool weather phenomena. Oh my gosh, it's one of the coolest things we get to do. It's so different from what you've seen, but I think that that really helps you better understand what we're trying to explain. Because then you have an idea of, oh yeah, I can see that. You met the love of your life working here at yes. NBC4. Yes, we ended up getting married here in Southern California, and the forecast for that was a perfect day. <laughs> I was just going to ask I you about that. I nailed that forecast. Uh, we're learning new details tonight about the local woman being held in Russia, accused of raising money supporting Ukraine in its defense against the Russian invasion. Ksenia Karolina has dual Russian-American citizenship, but loved ones tell us she lived here in Southern California since 2015. Yeah. NBC4's Alex Rozier joins us now with the latest. Alex. And she works at the SLS spa here at the SLS motel in Beverly Hills. But tonight she is detained in Russia. And today I spoke with her former mother-in-law who is desperately hoping she makes it back to America alive. Russia's Federal Security Service says this is a 33-year-old Los Angeles woman detained in Russia. A senior U.S. official told NBC News this is Ksenia Karilina. Eleonora Srebrovsky's former daughter-in-law. We all know that she did not do anything criminal. Eleonora found out today Ksenia was detained for raising funds to support Ukraine against the Kremlin invasion. The Federal Security Service statement said in part, since 2022, she was involved in providing financial assistance to a foreign state in activities directed against the security of our country. What's going through your mind after hearing that news? I'm still shaking. If she was helping something that was in her heart and she was feeling that this is the right thing to do. Eleanor's son and Cassinia got married in 2013, but split two years later. You will not encounter a lot of instances when former ex-mother-in-law would tell something good about her daughter-in-law, right? So I will, because I don't have anything bad to say about her. So she's a beautiful person, beautiful soul. This afternoon, a State Department official warned it may be difficult to help this dual citizen. Russia does not recognize dual citizenship, uh, considers them to be Russian citizens first and foremost. And so oftentimes we have a difficult uh, time getting consular assistance, but we will pursue it uh, in all matters where a U.S. citizen is detained. Cassinia works as an esthetician at the CL Spa in the SLS Hotel in Beverly Hills. The spa posted on Instagram saying she's wrongfully accused, adding she went to Russia to visit her 90-year-old grandmother, parents, and younger sister. She's just such a gentle flower, and I am very, very concerned about her physical being, about her mental being. Uh, I just want her back. Eleonora is hoping the president gets involved so Cassinia makes it home safe. If we do not help her here as American citizens, uh, Russian people will not help her. And tonight, a White House official told NBC News that they're working to learn more information here and secure consular access to Cassinia. But again, she's accused of treason, which may land her in a Russian prison for up to 20 years. Reporting live in Beverly Hills, I'm Alex Rozier, NBC4 News. All right, Alex, thank you. Our coverage of the final Senate debate continues, and we've been asking you, the viewers, to use the QR code here on your screen to tell us who you think won this debate, and you have delivered. We have received hundreds of comments. Concepcion from Van Nuys says Steve Garvey won the debate. She says she is sick and tired of corruption in government and likes Garvey's position on immigration and Israel. And Diane from Inglewood thinks Barbara Lee won. She says she's ready for California to eliminate the dirt in politics. We'll be right back. giveaway at corridor flow in lomita love this turnout here hi guys yeah our friends from telemundo 52 traffic always keeps me ahead so i can make sure i'm 
always early to work. The weather is uh, accurate. These are my kids. They learn high and low pressure from Belen. <laughs> you make people feel comfortable. It feels like family, honestly. Friendly faces. Yeah, friendly faces in the morning. These guys are dancing. A lot of energy, and it's something that, okay, now I can conquer the world. Cheers. Gracias, Lomita. Everybody cares about the weather. Yeah. That's something that matters to every single person. Yeah, it's more than the numbers. It's more than the forecast. I want to connect with our viewers. We're in it with them, so it is personal. Seven years in a row, the most accurate forecast. Hello. It says a lot about our team and that we're a team that people can trust. Whenever the weather goes south, now it's not just about planning your day, it's about potentially saving lives. So we want to make sure that our viewers feel prepared to keep themselves and their families safe. One of the things I love that you do is use our augmented reality to explain some really cool weather phenomena. Oh my gosh, it's one of the coolest things we get to do. It's so different from what you've seen, but I think that that really helps you better understand what we're trying to explain. Because then you have an idea of, oh yeah, I can see that. You met the love of your life working here at yes. NBC4. Yes, we ended up getting married here in Southern California, and the forecast for that was a perfect day. <laughs> I was just going to ask I you about that. I nailed that forecast. We want to bring in our political contributor, Dr. Fernando Guerra, tonight. That's right. We want to get your thoughts on the debate here tonight. Uh, who stood out? Who's walking home with their uh, tail between the legs? Well, I think they all four did. I think this was uh, by far the best debate. I know I'm being a little bit biased, but, you know, you had a lot of tension. You had someone being flustered. I think, uh, you know, Adam Schiff had to come into this debate and do no harm, and he got away with that. Uh, Katie Porter had to distinguish herself, and I think she did as the most progressive candidate. Barbara Lee, I thought, also distinguished herself in terms of her life experience and her perspective. That was very important. I think even Steve Garvey, he had to do no harm. I mean, he needs to get about 70% of the Republican vote to be able to make the runoff, and he just does not have to offend that base, and he didn't do that. Um, I thought the format was excellent. I thought Conan's question about foreign policy, where he made them say yes or no on four questions, and then let them elaborate was fantastic. There you saw some really contrast. On four of those questions, Barbara Lee uh, actually, on all four, Barbara Lee had a different response than Schiff did. And then there was a question on uh, nuclear power. Again, all three of the Democrats had a different response. Uh, so you saw some contrast. I know that a lot of people say they're all the same. They're three liberal Democrats, for sure. But they all had a, a, a different response. One place where they had all four of them the same response was the question that Alejandra from Telemundo asked about uh, immigration, where all four of them said that they would have voted no, along with uh, um, Senator Padilla. And remember, that bill actually passed I'm in the Senate, the 61 to 29. Were there any surprises to come out of the debate tonight, Dr. Guerra? Um, I think to me, the biggest surprise was uh, how Katie Porter actually got flustered at one point. And this is when Colleen was really uh, pushing her on the endorsements that she, of all the members of Congress from California, she only has one, whereas Schiff has 27 and Barbara Lee has eight. And she tried to like talk around it and mention others, but Colleen came back and I actually saw her be quite flustered. That was that was one People surprise. Working two and three jobs. The, the other part that was a little bit uh, surprising to me is how heated it got in terms of the earmarks between um, uh, uh, Porter and, and Schiff. Uh, and finally, my biggest surprise was, you know, the very beginning, the question about the cost of living and inflation was a time for people to really talk about our major issue in California about housing. One of the LMU students asked about or talked about affordable ho housing in the post debate, and they nobody brought that up, even though it was teed up for them in the very first question. What do you do about the high cost of living? Not a single one of the four talked about affordable housing other than the LMU student. All right, uh, Dr. Garrett, we appreciate uh, your time here tonight. Thanks for yeah. being with us. It was a great job by uh, the, the, the debate anchors. Great job. We'll yeah. pass it along. It All was right. an interesting one to watch for sure. <laughs> yeah. We're going to check in one more time with Colleen and Conan right after this.
coffee giveaway at Corridor Flow in Lomita. Love this turnout here. Hi, guys. Yeah. Our friends from Telemundo 52. Traffic always keeps me ahead so I can make sure I'm always early to work. The weather is uh, accurate. These are my kids. They learn high and low pressure from Belen. <laughs> you make people feel comfortable. It feels like family, honestly. Friendly faces. Yeah, friendly faces in the morning. These guys are dancing. A lot of energy, and it's something that, OK, now I can conquer the world. Cheers. Gracias, Lomita. Everybody cares about the weather. Yeah. That's something that matters to every single person. Yeah, it's more than the numbers. It's more than the forecast. I want to connect with our viewers. We're in it with them, so it is personal. Seven years in a row, the most accurate forecast. Hello. It says a lot about our team and that we're a team that people can trust. Whenever the weather goes south, now it's not just about planning your day, it's about potentially saving lives. So we want to make sure that our viewers feel prepared to keep themselves and their families safe. One of the things I love that you do is use our augmented reality to explain some really cool weather phenomena. Oh my gosh, it's one of the coolest things we get to do. It's so different from what you've seen, but I think that that really helps you better understand what we're trying to explain. Because then you have an idea of, oh yeah, I can see that. You met the love of your life working here at yes. NBC4. Yes, we ended up getting married here in Southern California, and the forecast for that was a perfect day. <laughs> I was just going to ask I you about that. I nailed that forecast. We're getting down to the wire. Super Tuesday is just two weeks away, and this was the last Senate debate. Let's check in one last time with Coney, Conan and Colleen. I made you guys one name there for your final thoughts. <laughs> We've been waiting for that for a long time. <laughs> All right, Michael and Carol, and I'm going to ask Conan a couple of questions because that's what I'm more comfortable with. Did anybody move the needle yeah, tonight? Needle? I don't think so. Uh, Fernando I, I, is correct, uh, Gara, and I appreciate his kind words about our involvement. Uh, when, when you're a candidate and this is the last debate, you have a goal in mind. This is what we want to accomplish. I think they ac all accomplish that. Um, if you're the leader in this race, you don't want to mess things up. Uh, and take too many risks. I don't think this changed the nature of the campaign at all. Kona, do you think a big part of the problem for the number three and four is that one of them is known in Northern California and the other one's known in Southern California, whereas the other two, Steve Garvey and Adam Schiff, are really known throughout the state? Uh, right, but keep this in mind. Um, Katie Porter did get uh, some uh, lots of statewide uh, recognition when she went to Congress as a freshman. She distinguished herself in some committee hearings with the whiteboard. She became a, a popular on MSNBC. Uh, and so that has catapulted her to a certain degree um, to a statewide audience. But, but your point is interesting because prior to this, if you're a member of Congress in California, running statewide is tough because you're one of 53 members of Congress. You're just one. But because of of the nature of the Trump campaign, the Trump presidency, MSNBC, Adam Schiff is known around the state because he is the number one guy that Donald Trump really hates in Washington. And so uh, even when Adam Schiff was censored by the Republicans in the House, there were members, uh, Republicans who went up to him and said, congratulations, we just got you elected to the U.S. Senate. <laughs> they knew that that's a badge of honor in California politics. Very quickly, the one thing that stood out in your mind in terms of topic tonight. Well, I thought uh, it, what was interesting is Katie Porter's effort to bring down Adam Schiff's numbers by attacking him. I don't know if it had any impact, but politically, that's what she's trying to do. She's trying to rob from his support. That's the only place where, you know, she can she can get a leg up. All right, Conan. Carolyn, Michael, back to you. All right, thank you both, and thanks for joining us for this special edition of the NBC4 News at 7 following the final Senate debate. Yes, and remember, Super Tuesday is March 5th. California is one of 15 states voting in the primary on that day. Night Court is coming up next on NBC4. We will, of course, be back tonight at 11 with a full wrap-up of the debate. Thanks for joining us, everyone. <laughs>